The last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark are a source of controversy in New Testament studies. Now, to be sure, this is a non-issue for most people, does not keep them awake at night. But because this controversy has, at times, been used to draw overly sweeping conclusions, I believe there would be some value in looking at what can and cannot be reasonably derived from the historical evidence. The controversy surrounds authorship. A majority of New Testament scholars hold that the person who wrote the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, that is Mark 16 verses 9 through 20, is different from the person who wrote the rest of the Gospel, that is everything up through chapter 16 verse 8. Now I'm well aware of the fact that there are those who believe that John Mark is not the author of the Gospel of Mark. I'll discuss that more thoroughly in my series, Who, When, and Why the Writing of the Gospels. For now, for simplicity's sake, we're going to refer to the author as Mark. So the view among most New Testament scholars is that Mark did not write the last 12 verses. We'll look at three principal data points used to support that conclusion. Number one, vocabulary and style. There are notable differences. In particular, there are several words in Greek used in the last 12 verses of Mark that aren't used anywhere else in the Gospel. And while this isn't probative on its own, it has convinced most who have looked at it that there's a different mind at work here. Certainly, a study of stylometry and unique words have their place in a rigorous analysis of the text. Argument number two, there are important early manuscripts, two in particular, of the Gospel of Mark that end at 16.8. They don't have the last 12 verses, suggesting that already at this early date, these two manuscripts, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, were written in the 4th century, that there were already Christians doubting the originality of the last 12 verses. To be sure, there are also early manuscripts that do include the last 12 verses, as we know them in most English Bibles, and there are manuscripts that include other endings to the Gospel. Broadly speaking, they all agree up through 16.8, and that is the point of departure where you get the different endings, suggesting to most who have looked at this textual problem that up through 16.8 is as far as their common history goes. Anything after that was written later. Now, to be honest about the evidence, about 99% of the Greek manuscripts of Mark include the last 12 verses. It's just a very small subset that have other endings. But because of the early date and importance of a couple of these manuscripts, that argument has tended to carry the day. And argument number three, the narrative arc of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is a master storyteller. We covered a bit of this in our video series looking at the arguments for and against Mark and priority. Mark is a dynamic writer or he's writing based on a dynamic speaker. He blends stories together with vivid detail to present a common theme. He has thought this through. And a number of people looking at the last 12 verses of Mark say, well, we've got this story that's been building the whole gospel, and it doesn't end the way the story built it up to end. It is as if, to use an analogy that will be familiar to my generation, the last four chapters of the Harry Potter series had been written by someone other than J.K. Rowling. No, I'm not trying to start a conspiracy theory here. They were written by J.K. Rowling. But if they had not been, the book series would be obviously disjointed because Rowling, the entire series, has been building up to those last four chapters where she will tie all the threads together and resolve the tension and open questions. If the author who conceived the story in the first place had been unable to finish and someone else was left with the overwhelming task of trying to tie all those threads together, it would be clear that someone else had written the ending. This is what a number of scholars see in the Gospel of Mark. They say, whoever wrote the last 12 verses, they just didn't tie the threads together the way the master storyteller had been building the story. Now, there are some scholars who believe that the last 12 verses of Mark are original. This is a minority view. Most hold that they are not. I'm not going to take a dogmatic position on this issue. Rather, the question I want to look at in this video is, if we grant, for sake of argument, that the last 12 verses are not original to the text. What does that mean? Broadly speaking, we have three options. Option one, 16.8 is the originally intended ending of Mark's Gospel. Option two, 16.8 was not the originally intended ending, but the author was unable to finish. And option three, 16.8 wasn't the original ending, but the original ending has been lost. These options are not equally probable. We'll consider each in turn, but it is worth making a comment about the politics of scholarship. Sometimes the politics can get in the way of the evidence. Particularly among skeptical communities, there is a strong preference for option one, that 16.8 was the originally intended ending of Mark's Gospel. 
One of the reasons for this is that it has implications, or they think it has implications they find desirable, if they want to discredit the resurrection of Jesus. Consider, if Mark was the first gospel written, which, by the way, I don't believe. You can see my videos on a synoptic problem for a critique of that view. But if Mark was the first gospel written, which many hold, and Mark's Easter story ends at 16.8, well, at that point, there are no post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. The women have been to the tomb. It's empty. They receive the proclamation. They haven't told anybody. And then the story just ends. Well, we can say, okay, there's a pretty simple Easter story here in Mark. That means that must be what early Christians believed. Mark's a, a well-informed early Christian. That would mean that Matthew and Luke, to say nothing of John, are adding in fantasy and, and fictitious details that were just embellished by Christians after the fact. This is, in the minds of skeptics, an argument they can use to discredit a belief in the resurrection. They'd like to say that early Christians did not believe in post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. This is demonstrably false. We'll get to that in just a moment. But it is important to point out specifically the deductive logic that is being used here. The key premise is that if Mark had known about post-resurrection appearances, he would have written about them. They then say, well, look, he didn't write about them, therefore he didn't know about them. Early Christians didn't believe in post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. That deductive logic is important, we'll come back to it in a moment. But I mentioned that the conclusion is demonstrably false. We'll show this two ways. First, from the writings of Paul. We have multiple letters from Paul clearly attesting that early Christians did believe in the resurrection, and especially in 1 Corinthians 15, showing that from right out the gate, Christians believed that Jesus had appeared to his apostles and others. Even very skeptical scholars acknowledge that 1 Corinthians 15 is really, really solid evidence for that belief. Mark himself shows us that he knows about post-resurrection appearances. He includes prophecies twice in his gospel that this is going to happen. He foreshadows it. And so, yes, Mark, as a well-informed early Christian, did know about post-resurrection appearances. There's no good historical case that he did not. So what does that mean? Well, let's take the skeptic's own premise and see where the argument leads us. Remember, premise one was, if Mark had known about post-resurrection appearances, he would have written about them. Now we had premise two, which just showed two different ways Mark did know about post-resurrection appearances. We've just shown deductively, then. The conclusion is Mark would have written about post-resurrection appearances. The skeptic's own argument this is people who champion 16.8 as the original intended ending of Mark in an effort to discredit the resurrection. Their own argument shows deductively that 16.8 is not the original ending of Mark's gospel. As long as we accept that first premise, that's their premise. That is where the deductive argument leads us. So we've shown deductively that we shouldn't believe that 16.8 is the original ending of Mark. I'd like to show that three other ways using textual evidence. Textual evidence number one. If Mark had ended at 16.8, he's probably ending in the middle of a sentence. The last word in Greek of verse 8 is guy. It's a conjunction, usually translated as for or sense, and it's a very odd way to end a sentence. It's not entirely unheard of, just very rare. It would be an even more odd way to end a book. If Mark had ended his gospel with the word guy, he would be the only author of anything remotely close to a comparable document in the entire corpus of Greco-Roman literature to have done so. The one or two examples that have been cited of books or articles, if you will, ending in gar, are not anything like Mark. This means we have zero corroborating evidence that it would be considered appropriate to end a book like Mark with the word gar. That's not a proof that it couldn't have been done. It just means that it's very improbable and we should not use this as a default assumption. The default assumption is, this doesn't look like the ending. This looks like the middle of a sentence. That's going to be supported by textual argument number two. Not only are we probably ending in the middle of a sentence, we're also ending in the middle of a pericope. A pericope is the way that gospel scholars divide up the gospels. An individual story, often just a few verses, one miracle or one parable, you could pick up and move several parables and you'd still have the whole story. Well, 16.8 cuts off in the middle of a pericope. How do we know that? Because at the end of 16.8, the women have left, and they haven't told anyone because they are afraid. Well, evidently they did tell someone because Mark is writing it down. Now, some might say, okay, well, that's obvious to us, but people anciently weren't clever enough to figure that out. This is condescending, and it has no place in a serious scholarly discussion. There is no substantive biological difference in the cognitive capabilities of humans 2,000 years ago and humans today. 
yes, ancient people may not have had access to all of the education that many have today, but they were not stupid. There is an obvious plot gap here. Mark ends by saying, the women didn't tell anyone? Well then how are you writing this, Mark? How do you know this? Clearly they did tell someone. To complete the story, Mark would need to provide that information. He has not yet done so. Suggesting the pericope is not over, and a more adequate conclusion would be, they didn't tell anyone on the way from the tomb to Peter or the apostles because they were afraid, but eventually they did tell someone. Textual argument number three. We're not just cutting off in the middle of a sentence and cutting off in the middle of a pericope. We're cutting off the arc of Mark's narrative. Mark hasn't finished the story. This was one of the evidences we cited just a moment ago for why the last 12 verses don't look like part of the original. Because the master storyteller hasn't finished tying together the threads of this beautiful story. He has, he has bumped, he has set, he's ready to spike the, the end of the story. He has set up a fantastic reconciliation between Jesus and the apostles, and at 16.8, he has not yet done so. He has foreshadowed, he has predicted, Jesus will appear. Mark makes a point of showing that Jesus' prophecies are fulfilled. He has said this will happen, he hasn't demonstrated it yet, and we already showed earlier, Mark did know about post-resurrection appearances. Now certainly people have come up with all manner of ex post facto explanations for why Mark might have chosen to end his gospel at 16.8, but they're just that. They're ex post facto explanations. The options are as limitless as the human imagination. But if we read the story Mark is telling, without trying to read into it any code or hidden riddles, Mark has already told us how the story is going to end earlier in his gospel. But as of 16.8, he just hasn't gotten there yet. The master storyteller has not finished telling the story of his master. On the basis then of the deductive argument and three textual arguments, I suggest that 16.8 is very probably not the original ending of Mark's gospel. Many adopt it because it is seductive. It has implications that some find desirable, particularly if they wish to discredit the resurrection or fit in with, with the more skeptical branch of scholars. But looking at the historical evidence, it didn't add up very well. I suggest 16.8 is not the originally intended ending, and option one should not be given anything close to a default position. Let's look then at option two. That 16.8 wasn't the originally intended ending, but the author was unable to finish. Some have envisioned he's sitting there mid-sentence and the Romans burst in and arrest Mark and then haul him off. Well, certainly the Romans did arrest Christians at times and haul them off, but this isn't terribly likely. If they really had burst in right while he's working on the gospel, they're not likely to carefully preserve and protect, much less publish Mark's work. A, a more likely story that has been suggested is maybe the author died, just wasn't able to finish. Well, the patristic evidence definitely says that isn't what happened. The writings of early Christian historians say that Mark did live to publish his gospel. Now, some have said, oh yeah, well, the patristics are historically worthless. We can discard that. I think sometimes we're just a little too full of ourselves and a little too quick to discard any and all historical value from the patristics. Aside from the patristic evidence, though, I'd like to present two arguments against option two. Neither of them will make the point on their own, but when combined, they will. Argument number one. The Gospel of Mark was a successful piece of literature. It wasn't a bestseller on the same order as Matthew, but there's only one top spot on the bestseller list. Mark was definitely a successful piece of literature. How do we know this? Well, it survived. Most early Christian literature did not. That's already clearing a pretty high bar. But more than that, it didn't just survive. It was already being quoted as authoritative in the second century by people who were not far removed from the original eyewitnesses of Jesus. That's a really high bar to clear. But more than that, it didn't just survive. It wasn't just quoted as authoritative. It made it into the Christian canon. That's an incredibly high bar. Of all the thousands of writings of early Christians, only 27 documents made that cut. Some of them, it was a little bit touch and go. Was 2 Peter going to make it in? Were 2 and 3 John going to make it in? There was some debate on that. Mark cleared the bar with no trouble. There, there was never any serious doubt that Mark was going to make the cut. This means that Mark had to be sponsored by one or more prominent churches. It was said to be credible. Its provenance was believed. What does this mean? It means that from the get-go, someone had to champion the Gospel of Mark for it to become 
a successful piece of literature. That kind of success does not happen by accident. This is not a case where someone found an unfinished manuscript in an attic years later. I'm not sure what this is. Let's publish it and see what happens. No, this is a document where somebody early on championed it, said this should be read in the churches. Somebody ensured it got a distribution. Argument number two. We need to take a moment to look at first century writing practices. First of all, the author of a document was rarely the person who actually scratched letters onto a scroll. You would hire a professional scribe to do that. The author is the one who is responsible for the message. They might dictate to the scribe, they might give the scribe an outline and say, okay, flesh this out, and read it back to me. The message is sent in their authority, but they're usually not the one actually penning the message. This was a team effort, an author and one or more scribes. We also need to point out that in the first century, writing materials, as a percentage of your market basket of goods, were much more expensive than they are now. You didn't write a first draft on an expensive scroll. You know, there were cheaper materials or reusable materials, wax tablets being an option. The Gospel of Mark, as we have it, is not a first draft. Some might say, well, we don't think it's a final draft either. Maybe they intended to polish it up a little bit. That actually has no bearing on the argument I'm making. The only point we need to establish is that Mark is not a first draft. One, because it's clearly structured and thought through. This has been worked on. This has been carefully developed. Second, wax tablets wouldn't fit the whole Gospel of Mark. This is something that came to us on a scroll. So if Mark is not a first draft, and this was a team effort, the author and one or more scribes, what does that mean? It means that even if the author had dropped dead mid-sentence, the scribe already knows how the story ends. They can finish the story. They could even consult a previous draft. There's no need to publish an incomplete manuscript. Let's now put these two arguments together. The Gospel of Mark was not discovered in an attic incomplete years later. And the scribe and or others knew how the story ended. This means that whoever championed the Gospel of Mark in its early years, whoever that sponsor was, had access to how the story ended. There was no need to publish an incomplete story. A story so obviously incomplete that over the years, multiple early Christian communities wrote their own endings. So the case for option two, that 16.8 was not the originally intended ending, but the author was unable to finish, is not particularly strong. We can't absolutely rule it out, there's just not a lot of good evidence for it, and some decent evidence against it. That leaves us with option three. I suggest option three is the simplest option. 16.8 was not the original ending, but the original ending has been lost. Now, we can only speculate about how exactly that may have happened. Many possibilities present themselves, which are not difficult to imagine. Somebody got the manuscript too close to the fire, or it was torn, or somebody didn't sew the last sheet on. You could stitch multiple sheets together to make a longer scroll. Any such event could have happened, in which case we only have part of the Gospel of Mark. We have most of it, but the ending is missing. Now, some have said, okay, well, if it was written on a codex, that's possible. The end of a codex is vulnerable. But if it's written on a scroll, the end of the scroll is the safest part of the scroll. This wouldn't have happened. Well, no. I think too much has been made on this argument because the end of a scroll is the safest part of the scroll when it is being stored. But not when it's being read, not when it's being written, not when it's being used. Whatever part of the scroll is open at the moment is the most vulnerable part of the scroll when it's being used, and that's when it's most likely for something like fire or a tear to damage the manuscript, not when it's sitting safely on a shelf. And so I suggest that any part of the scroll is vulnerable to damage. And if the original ending was lost, we can explain the textual evidence with no difficulties. I'm now going to present a plausible case for how this happened. I'm not suggesting this is exactly how it happened, only that this is a simple explanation that is clean and consistent with the writings of early Christian historians. The patristic evidence tells us that the Gospel of Mark was written by Mark in Rome based upon the preaching of Peter, and that Mark wrote because Caesar's knights, presumably a reference to members of the equestrian order, insisted, Mark, please write down what Peter taught. Mark wasn't exactly planning to do this, but eventually they prevailed upon him to write it. The patristic evidence also tells us that Mark went to Alexandria. He published his gospel there, and he founded the church in Alexandria. Well, let's put these two data points together. Mark isn't intending to write a gospel, but finally they persuade him to do it. 
He's intending to go to Alexandria, but he's got to finish this project first. He writes the gospel as they've requested. They're anxious to get a copy and make a copy of it, and then Mark's going to go to Alexandria. They're not going to let him leave with the only copy. They've been asking him to write this. They're going to make a copy before he leaves. Well, somewhere in that process, the manuscript is damaged. Burned, torn, somebody didn't stitch a sheet on, other possibilities. And so the original copy made by the Church of Rome, who's anxious to get this material, is made from an incomplete manuscript. Mark goes to Alexandria. Whether or not he rewrites the ending, or he's busy founding a church, maybe he has somebody else write the ending, either way, the influential church in Rome, that will go on to be the most influential of the early Christian churches, a church that some of the patristic evidence suggests was actually responsible for disseminating documents to the other churches, that influential church has a document that ends at what we call Mark chapter 16, verse 8. And so through a Darwinian process, that version of the text survives. And so in the 4th century, when scribes are writing Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, they think, you know, we've got some old copies here, some prominent, important copies of Mark that end at 16.8. We're not sure about the rest of this, if that's supposed to be there or not. Is this exactly how it happened? Probably not. But there are details here that are very plausible, that present no historical difficulties, that present no textual difficulties, and they're consistent with the patristic writings. I suggest the simplest solution, can't be proved, but the simplest solution to the ending of Mark, if we grant for sake of argument that the last 12 verses are not original, is that the original ending was lost. This would allow the master storyteller to have done what he has set up throughout his story to actually tie the threads together at the end as a master storyteller would be expected to do. He doesn't end in the middle of a sentence, he doesn't end in the middle of a pericope, and he finishes the narrative he's presenting. Some have suggested the Gospel of Mark is about the Apostles, and that's why it ends at 16.8. It's not about the Apostles. The Gospel of Mark is about Jesus. How does it begin? The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. That is what this story is about. The apostles are major sub-characters, but the main character is Jesus. The focus is Jesus. Mark has not finished the story of Jesus at 16.8. And so I contend that 16.8 is not the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. So we've looked at the three options. I'd now like to look at what are the implications of the ending of Mark. One, for the authority of the last 12 verses. Two, for early Christian history and belief in the resurrection. And three, for the synoptic problem my area of study. First, for the authority of the last 12 verses. Notice I've been commenting on the originality of the last 12 verses. I actually don't think there's much of an argument to be made against the authority of the last 12 verses. It's being quoted as authoritative already in the second century. For example, Irenaeus of Lyon, who's just one link removed from apostolic testimony through his own teacher, Polycarp, quotes from the last 12 verses of Mark, and he treats it as authoritative. Now, maybe Irenaeus just doesn't know the textual history there. As possible. Or maybe, option two, he knows what we know, and yet he believes that this information is reliable and, and accurate, and so he has no problem quoting it. Or maybe option three, the one we moderns don't like to think about, but with a dose of humility we probably should. Maybe this early well-informed source actually knows something that we don't know. Heaven forbid, right? Maybe Irenaeus knows something we don't know. Maybe he does know where that text comes from and he has no problem quoting it as authoritative. In any event, virtually everything in the last 12 verses of Mark is found elsewhere in Scripture, and so I don't think there's any reason to be afraid of them for any textual or historical reasons. Second, implications for early Christian history and a belief in the resurrection. I pointed out earlier that there are some skeptical scholars who like to use the truncated ending of Mark to argue that early Christians didn't have resurrection beliefs anything like what's presented in Matthew and Luke. We, we demonstrated that that's false. Early Christians did believe that Jesus appeared to the apostles and others. And so there really are no historical gotcha moments, whatever the original ending of Mark. There are no implications for Christians inventing the resurrection years later. It's just, it's not in the cards. It's not in the historical evidence. There's no significant implication to be drawn here. And finally, implications for the synoptic problem. Some have used the brief ending, the truncated ending at Mark 16.8, as a means of arguing for Mark and priority. The theory goes that, well, Mark's got a pretty simple Easter story. If you stop at 16.8, Matthew and Luke have 
much more complex Easter stories. The simple must have come earlier, the complex later, therefore Mark was the first gospel written. Well, this doesn't work. First, because the simple is always earlier is a decidedly flawed premise. People have been writing summaries for thousands of years. Even in Christian writings, we can see this, that people later quote the Gospels and provide summaries, and whichever of the synoptic Gospels we conclude is written third, at some points in writing, summarized, shortened, condensed the material from his sources. So no, I don't think the simple is always earlier argument works at all. Furthermore, using tenuous assumptions about the ending of the Gospel of Mark in order to try to solve the synoptic problem is, I believe, backwards. We have a lot of good evidence we can use to construct a theory on the synoptic problem. We don't need to resort to speculation about how Mark may or may not have intended to end his gospel. To use the ending of Mark to try to solve the synoptic problem is, I believe, trying to put the foundation on top of the walls. Our study of the synoptic problem may have implications for the ending of Mark, but the other way around is using the weak evidence to argue against the strong. I think this is backwards. What we do and do not know about the ending of the Gospel of Mark is an insufficiently stable foundation upon which to make a solid theory of the synoptic problem viable. And if the original ending has been lost, we don't even have the text and we can't make a textual argument. In conclusion, to summarize the ground we've covered, early Christians, including Mark, did believe in the resurrection and post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Second, if we grant for sake of argument that the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark are not part of the original, the most viable conclusion is that the original ending of Mark's Gospel has been lost. And third, assumptions about how Mark did or did not intend to end his Gospel do not provide a solid foundation upon which to argue for Mark in priority or any other theory on the synopsis.